I'll be giving you a brief overview about this particular technology. And before I begin with, I would like to tell you that this particular technology is not new. Uh, why new? Because the concept was evolved way back in 1854 by Dr. John Snow, who what, what he did is there was a uh, cholera uh, flu was there and because of cholera, the, the entire understanding of the administration was failed. So, what Dr. John Snow did, he mapped the entire cholera where the cases were there and they found that there was one water pump which was responsible for this entire epidemic. So, basically this concept came at that time and he was at that time he was called as a father of uh, epidemiology and also he was called as father of GIS. But later uh, Tomlinson was called as the father of GIS, but earlier days he was considered to, uh, to uh, he was considered to be a person who was uh, basically who has evolved geographical information system. So, you can see that the utility of GIS is many folds. The reason is it can, it can be used to any applications and you might have seen that lot of applications are already uh, being used by many organizations. So, the before we go into that we should know what is a geographical information system. Uh, well, uh, you might have seen satellite images, you might have heard about GPS, you might have heard about Gagan, you might have heard about so many n number of uh, data sets which are being provided and which basically provides you a geospatial information. But here this GIS is con considered to be a bigger umbrella wherein you can take all the inputs from various sources and the beauty of it is you can integrate them together and you can generate new outputs. So, if you see it is considered to be a computer based system that provides four sets of capabilities. Well, if you see there are four capabilities means inputting, database management, manipulation analysis and output. But here the most important thing is you are dealing with geospatial data. You are not talking about a norm, normal non-spatial, but it is geospatial which has got a geolocation means latitude and longitude. So, that data could be in the form of point line on polygon or it could be in the even, even in the form of satellite images. So, what GIS is does it takes the input which has got a geospatial coordinates, it puts it into the database management. When it puts into the database management means you can apply any type of capabilities at the data DBMS level. Okay? Means whatever the uh, capabilities of DBMS are there, it is already embedded into any of the geographical information system. The third part is the manipulation and analysis means uh, you can query your data, you can fire an SQL query, you can fire any type of query and apart from that you can even fire a spatial query. Spatial query means you have thousands of polygons, you have thousands of lines or, and from there you want to pick out some of the data which you are interested. So, that you can only do it if you have that manipulation and analysis capabilities. And the third part, the fourth part is the output means how you are visualizing your data. So, all these different capabilities makes GIS stronger compared to any of the system like you might have heard about RDBMS system, relational database management. I do not know only computer science people might have heard, but other people may not have heard. But here it is called as a special type of DBMS wherein all the DBMS capabilities are there, but also it supports geospatial data. Okay. So, it is it is a robust system and it can handle any type of data which is which has got a geospatial coordinates. Okay. Now, if you see they are totally all these different stages are directly or functionally related to each other. You have to input the data, you have to create the database, query analysis and output. So, any of these stages if it is not there or if some of the stages are not working, then it is not possible for you to ultimately come out with a product. Like for instance, if your data is not there, you, you cannot create a database. If your database is not there, then the integrity of the data is lost. Okay. Then if the query analysis means if it does not have a query and analysis, then it will like a CAD system which only provides the data generation. But query analysis is a stronger part of any of the GIS software and ultimately the output and visualization, how you are presenting your data. Because you might be having a good amount of data, if you are not presenting it 
in a in a in a in a in a better way it will not uh, serve the purpose so your output visualization query database everything is very important and they are explicitly linked to each other okay then if you see uh, uh, there are uh, there are set of tools already available you might have seen that uh, there are so many commercial softwares available and there are some open source softwares available but the basic functionality of gis software is available in both cots as well as open source you may have some more capabilities in the commercial because they are doing business but if you see open source they are providing the basic capabilities and apart from that basic capabilities they are also providing some additional functionalities which may not be there in other softwares okay so if you see all the open source series some of the softwares are good in database some of them are good in dm digital elevation model so every individual softwares are being developed on a particular project wherein the theme of the project was some some specific capability so most of the open source uh, softwares are more uh, specific they are may, they might be having some general basic tools but they are more inclined towards specific applications then then uh, well it is nothing but a set of tools a system or i can call it an information system which can capture analyze uh, visualize all those capabilities are embedded into any of the geographical information system then the database definition database is considered to be a most important because why the reason is you know that dbms has got certain set of capabilities it can allow the 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 integrity of the data is kept because you can apply any type of constraints to the rdbms once those constraints are applied you will see that the data is correct for analysis because if your data is incorrect your whatever the output because your error will propagate from one uh, stage to different stages so you can see that database definition is very important like you might have seen you might have heard about a uh, geo database model i don't i don't know how many of you have have you heard about geo database model no uh, esri has given this concept of geo database model wherein you can define your own schemas you can define your data structure you can store this and then within that you can have the relations you can have the queries everything will be embedded into a single database system so that is the capability of a geo database model like for instance if you are planning to develop a geo database for the medicinal plant you can define a big schema wherein all the partner institute who like your parent institute or maybe your uh, whatever the institutes which are related they can create the data for you and it can easily be integrated into your big database model so that way you can create a geo database model and once database model is is available the interoperability between the data becomes easy so that's why all those uh, concepts are important and the third one is the you can develop the decision support system the most important thing is you might have heard about dss but dss are more theme specific i can develop a decision support system for species uh, uh, mapping i can develop dss for like other application like watershed management uh, forest fire i can develop theme specific dss so those type of dss can be created within geographical information system framework okay so so there are certain characteristics of a geographic data one is a spatial data another one is a non spatial data spatial data basically talks about features orientation shape size or structure means any polygon any point any line the 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 extent the shape everything will talk about the spatial data and what will be the non spatial data non spatial data talks about the quality of that particular object so there could be infinite attributes to a given polygon so from from a given data you can generate n number of outputs so person uh, if is not aware of gis the the, the, the uh, they can create n number of things so from a given spatial data i can have n number of maps on the basis of the attributes given okay so that is the non spatial data and this the, the other one is the spatial data now you can see that this is an example of a tree which has got location where you are providing latitude and longitude and the another part is the attribute information means uh, species uh, name height age branches i can have n number of things so the the right side is the non spatial data the left side is the spatial data so you can see that any object on the ground will always have a geolocation if geolocation is there you can add n number of attributes to it okay 
so once that is there then there are some characteristics like uh, where what how and when so whenever an object is there into gis you can say that where is that location what is that object means attribute how it is related to other objects and when it is going to change when means at t1 time this object looks like this maybe at t2 time this objects can have a different temporal uh, the dynamics can change like forest fire or let us say talk about deforestation maybe in 1960 the forest was with different uh, uh, their, their, their polygon size was different the moment some deforestation has taken place the forest polygon has changed so that dynamics part can easily be associated with any of the spatial data so when we talk about components of gis there are certain components like hardware software data and people now when we talk about hardware if you go down the line like let us talk about 15 20 years back at that time people were using hardware of well, digitizing table was there big system was there where people have to spend lot of money to really work on a gis project but nowadays hardware is only limited to a laptop you can have a laptop with a open source software data you can get it from different there are so many different portals available across the globe like if you talk about india bhavan is already there bhavan can give you all type of satellite data it can allow you to access wms services it can allow the downloading of the data everything is possible and the sec the, the last part is the people the person who knows how to operate gis so if all these three four people four things are there you can say that the components of gis can be analyzed and they can do the project so the sources of input data uh, uh, like i was mentioning in my starting slide is uh, the uh, you can say that you can take uh, inputs from remote sensing you can take inputs from hard copy maps you can take inputs from lidar data gps total station photogrammetry the sky is the limit you can take any because anything on this earth has got a geospatial coordinates so anything can be integrated even you can integrate the census data which can, which is associated with district associated with state and it can be associated to any taluk so that way you can link any type of information to a gis platform okay but only thing is you have to think that how your objective of medicinal plants can be thought of and how the database can be designed that is the most important thing so now the thing comes that there are so many geographical phenomena which are happening on the ground but the most important thing is how i can map them by making use of gis like there could be so many studies were shown to you every study has got some geographical phenomena and that geographical phenomena has to be stored into computer so there are different ways and means to store the geospatial data so you can see that there are two types of models which are prominent one is raster data model another one is vector data model have you heard about these names yeah so raster is called raster is faster but is faster okay means you have so many pixels and that pixels is enormous like satellite data satellite data is nothing but the pixels so they they can be called as a raster data model the the second uh, data model is called as a vector data model so any phenomena on the ground you will have the data either in the form of vector or it could be in the form of raster it depends the what type of geographic phenomena is available you can see that there is a real world and within the real world you have the vector representation and you have a raster representation so both the raster and vector has got advantages and disadvantages it depends in which area you want to uh, to to do see so generally if you from the satellite image if you are generating some point line polygon that will always be vector but if the if you are directly taking a satellite data which has got certain pixels will always be called as a raster data model so these are the two fundamental data which is being used to store in the computer because you you should have some data model in order to store them into computer so these are the two data models which are being used by the gis community so when we talk about raster data model it is considered to be a simple data model the reason is it works on rows and columns you can see that first row first column b attribute first row second column b attribute that way you are storing the entire data so programming of a raster data is more simple compared to a vector data model so you can see that the entire data model of raster is simple in nature because of rows and columns the second 
The second one is the vector data model. It is considered to be a complex data model. The reason is it deals with coordinate pairs. Now, since coordinate pairs are involved, so you have to store either point, line or polygon. So, every point, line, polygon has got some x, y coordinate pairs. So, programming in vector is more difficult compared to raster data model. Okay. So, if you see this, uh, there is an entity A, uh, you can see the point A. So, th that uh, this point can easily be, uh, you can see this point, I, maybe you cannot, uh, A point is there, B point is, C point is there. So, every point has got S y coordinates and they have the attribute. So, here we are storing the data in the form of coordinates. But what is the difference between the line and polygon by seeing the, the, the uh, data structure? What is the difference between B and C? How, how if, if I do not show you the picture, if I only show you this table, will you be able to tell that the first uh, like graph line reading line we can make out? First, first and last is same. 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 So, the coordinate pairs are same, it is a close polygon. Close, if it is not same, then it will be a line. Mm -hmm. So, that way you can understand that whether it is a line, point or a polygon. Okay. okay. Then uh, the other part of this is like once you are ready with so many vector layers, there could be a road layer, there could be a uh, bus route, there could be a uh, land use polygon, there could be your some locations of medicinal plant. Let us talk about uh, the environmental layers. You have climatic data. When you talk about climatic data, you have rainfall data, you have uh, uh, temperature. temperature data, you have soil data, you have NDVI, so many things are there. You can overlay them together. And if you happen to ha you happen to see some of the coordinates, like for instance, these are the places where medicinal plants are there. You can directly relate with the vertical layers and see that what is the actual niche it is creating. So, once that niche is, is known to you, you can see that this particular plant can be can also be grown with a similar place where you are having the similar type of condition. You may have some same rainfall, same elevation. So, you can tell to the people who are basically cultivating that, that these are the places where the site suitability is possible. So, th like species distribution modeling works with this concept only. The locations are known to you. From the locations, you take the vertical profile of all the layers and set the extent. Means, temperature is from maximum 26 to 25. Then uh, the rainfall is from 200 to 300 millimeter. The uh, land use is this. Once this criteria is satisfied somewhere else, you can tell the person, the farmers, that you can cultivate the same crop at this because the environmental conditions is more or less similar. So, that type of site suitability modeling can be explored when you make use of these type of data sets. Then uh, another important thing is the topology. Topology is considered to be the backbone of GIS. The reason being is that the entire analysis what you do on a computer is totally governed by topology. The basic meaning is that there are three spatial relationships, the area, contiguity and connectivity. If you, if the, if the particular vector data and it happens in vector, not in raster. Okay. That topological model states that if there is any transformation given to a model, its area, contiguity and connectivity will not change. That will only change if you, if you uh, uh, change like if you, uh, the, if there are two polygons are merged, they are merged together or you are changing starting node, ending node, only then the topology has to be re rebuilt. But if you do any type of uh, rubber sheeting, it will never change. The contiguity, the means your neighbors will remain same, your special relationship will be same, starting node and ending node will be same, area may change, but you will have the area. Okay. So, that topological uh, relationships are quite important. Now, if you see this, these eight relationships are only possible with ArcGIS. If you see open source like QGIS, QGIS you will only find three or four special relationships. And what does it mean? Means there are two layers. I want to see those polygons which are disjoint, disjoint to each other. Means I do not want uh, those polygons like there is a forest polygon and there is a water body. So, I, I want those uh, polygons which are disjoint to forest and water body, automatically it will highlight those polygons. Similarly, I want those polygons which are adjoining to forest, pod, forest uh, uh, boundaries. So, automatically those polygons will be, because if you do one by one, it will take months 
to complete that task. But once you fire the spatial relationships, all those uh, analysis uh, uh, analysis means the query is easily possible. And here the query is not based on your simple SQL, but it is based on spatial relationships. Similarly, you can use equal, inside, all these eight relationships are intact in commercial software, but in open source you have some three or four uh, available, but every version by version they are increasing these spatial relationships. So now what GIS can answer? Now here the most important thing is, well there are few areas like location. I want to find, if you have already database where thousands polygons are, are there, you can fire a query and identify that polygon which you are looking for. That is where is, where, what is that, what is that? Then where is it? That location you can find, where is that location? You can easily fire a condition. I want to see those polygons which are more than 300 square meters. So automatically those polygons will be highlighted because your GIS database is already created. Then what has changed, sorry what has changed since means you can understand the climate change impact means if there is a change in the temperature if there is a change in the rainfall how the species will so that type of things can be directly done by making use of trends the, then what spatial pattern exists means temperature rainfall because of the like let us talk about mountain ecosystem because of orographic effect you can see that the entire like in Uttarakhand if you see rainfall at one point here you are totally dry and on the other side you are totally wet. So that is because of the orographic effect all that patterns can be understood if you take the interpolated maps available with you and then what if scenario what if scenario is really you can do the simulations means if there is like uh, Kedarnath sort of thing if the if there is a breach of the lake, then what will be the damage in the end? That flood simulation, all that type of simulations can be done by making use of GIS. So you can see that especially 3D GIS. 3D GIS is also an area where you can really explore that what is the potential of this technology towards various applications. So uh, there are so many things uh, we are not covering uh, other aspects. But here now you can see that there is questions like, uh, uh, where is the nearest school to my home? I can do that by making use of GIS. If your GIS database is there, I can easily understand that where are the places, schools are available and I can send my child to that place. So that can be done by making use of GIS. Then choosing where to locate a new refinery. Like I want to do cultivation in a new area where I can get the maximum productivity. That type of site suitability can easily be done if you have already available database with you. Okay, So that is one. Another thing is change and intended hiking route means you can even do the routing. There will be one lecture on routing also. Graph theory, there is a new concept which is not there in your timetable. I have recently put. So that what is the ne network connectivity between one, one uh, species to another? That type of uh, things can also be explored which gives you an idea that how the different routing can be done for different ecological species. Then modeling effects of change of land use, land cover on soil erosion. That is also one of the important area. So you, all those things can be explored by making use of simple query, spatial query, multi-layer operations, surface analysis. So there, there are n number of things and even if you see uh, in most of the applications GIS is being practiced. So you can see that the, the, the analysis part, the vector and raster, you have because you, their data models are different, their entire structure is different, the analysis is slightly different. Vector analysis, if you see, uh, you have, uh, you talk about union intersection, we'll be showing you what all uh, things you can do. Uh, union intersection in vector, dissolve, clip, proximity means, uh, maybe at uh, one kilometer, two kilometer, what are the areas which are coming under that proximity, pattern analysis, means uh, your uh, geostatistic interpolation, all those things can be done and networking analysis which talks about the shortest route from one point to another on the basis of the impedance or on the basis of resistance, how the, the, the one particular like we talk about transport GIS, transport GIS is totally based on networking analysis. You can give the impedance on the basis of uh, traffic, traffic congestion, you can do impedances on the basis of uh, what we can say uh, distance. You can give impedances on the basis of uh, uh, noise, pollution, all those things can be done and that can give you the optimal path that this is the path you can follow 
by making do, uh, reduction of noise, reduction of all those criteria can be set. Similarly, raster, because their data structure is different, you can see that you can uh, do local focal zonal and global operations. Uh, you can work on math, uh, map algebra means you can fire any type of algebraic operations on these data sets means A plus B plus C, A, A could be another layer, B could be another layer and you can apply any type of arithmetic operation on those layers. Then terrain analysis, hydrological analysis, reclassification, there are so many things you can apply on the raster data. But you cannot apply a mathematical operation on the vector data because the data model will not support. Okay, so that is the basic difference between the raster and vector. So I was just, uh, these are the map overlaying, you can see that uh, these are the overlay uh, of vector and raster. Similarly, you can see that for vector, you can see that we are doing the the union of both the data. Here you can see that there are two polygons, here you are seeing four polygons. When you do in, uh, the union, you will see that there you have more number of pol polygons and also the attributes. The attributes of map A and map B is taken into the final output and you have more number of polygons. So you can think of what type of uh, analysis you can apply to your data sets. So that is uh, some of the examples. Another one is the, the raster. You can see that you are applying any type of mathematical operations on uh, onto your layer and you will get the output on the basis of uh, and operator or operator those type of things can be explored. So now we will talk about the geospatial applications. So some of the applications I have kept uh, which are specific to medicinal plants. Well, this is the, the slide uh, uh, the, which actually I was involved into the biodiversity project which was considered to be a national level project and there were many findings in that project because this uh, that project continued for 12 years and that was a good experience for all of our because I was also uh, doing research and this thing. At that time, there were really some good findings uh, re related to th these three species. Texas Wally China, everybody knows that it is a cancer curing drug and in uh, when we were doing northeast uh, the analysis, the satellite image came and there was a peculiar uh, reflectance, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the entire uh, tone and texture of this particular area was totally different. Then one of our team went there for tracking up to uh, five to six days and we reached there and we, we saw that this entire Tali Valley, it is called as Tali Valley and this area, this is totally Texas, means there was a big, big trees of Texas which was unexplored. You got my point? So this was one of the finding and this entire intimation we gave to Department of Biotechnology because this project was given by Department of Biotechnology and they have further communicated to the concerned department. So this was taken as the, it was totally conserved and people can uh, like it was being used for medicinal purposes because this is a cancer. Another was hypophy ravenoides. You can directly see on a satellite image that which are the area where this particular species is grown because they have a peculiar spectral reflectance. Now spectral reflectance can be based on chlorophyll content, it can be based on the leaf area index, it can be based on many properties. So on that prop on that basis you can easily identify the hypophy. Th that was also the finding of this particular project. Another one was ephedra which has also got the medicinal value. So these three plants we could easily identify on a satellite image. And see, because if you are working in this, this, this area, you can directly make use of the satellite image and map them easily. And also, if you have a spectral profile, which was mentioned, they are nothing but the, for different bands, you have the spectral profile. If you are working on a hyperspectral, then you, you will have a spec, uh, specific spectral profile for a particular species. And that profile can help you to identify that in which area this particular plant could be could could be available or it can be found. So this is one of the uh, outputs. Another thing is this also I have borrowed uh, from my one of my colleague uh, that is a species level uh, mapping. Here you can see that economic prospecting gregarious. Gregarious formation when you talk about this you do not need a very high resolution data. You can do it with the coarser resolution because the temporal resolution is also very high. So you can make use of list 3 and A waves to see the sal, teak and bamboo. Similarly, for ephedra, hypophy, you can make use of list 3 and list 4 data, which the resolution is slightly coarser. When you talk about teak, eucalyptus, orchard, you can make use of list 3 A waves. Similarly, species association, 
like sandalwood, diptoria carpus, all those, you need a high resolution data. Like for medicinal plant, you also need a high resolution data. So, uh, th there was a question which you mentioned that how the drone can be used. See, drone can only be used for specific locations. See, at some level, the core satellite data can pinpoint some of the area. Within that, you can go to further higher resolution. From there, you can pick up some of the association. If you really want to go further, you can make use of drone or UAVs. So, you, you cannot plan it for the entire because you will not get uh, like Google Earth, you will not see high resolution data for forest area. You will only see high resolution for the urban. Okay. So, you do not have to collect the data for every places. You only have to collect the data where you need the information. Okay. So, that way it can be planned. But when you talk about ecological conservation, you have landscape, you have habitat, you have ecological niche and then potential distribution. And that can be easily be done by making use of the existing data. Like LIS 3, you have 23.5 meter resolution, uh, AWS 56 meter, that way you can make use. So, you have to see that what type of analysis you are interested, see that what resolution can support. And after that, if you think that it is needs a high resolution, only then you should go for high resolution. Otherwise, it is not required to really, uh, so like gregarious formation, you can easily do it with a coarse resolution, coarse resolution satellite data. You do not need a high resolution. But for medicinal plants, like there was a question that some of the herbs and shrubs, how they can be mapped? They can be mapped on the basis of the trees, because you will not find all those herbs and trees in all the trees. You will can only find because and also it is not only the tree, you can also relate with soil, you can relate with atmospheric uh, environmental variables and see that some locations can help you to explore that there could be an area where the possibility of those data sets is there. So, you can, you can have the rainfall uh, surfaces, you can have the landform soil, you can have altitude, slope aspect, all these layers for those areas can be created and once they are created because if you see. Rainfall is going to change, uh, temperature is going to change, but landforms is not going to change much. Soil, altitude, slope aspect, all those things are static parameters. Dynamic parameters are environmental vari or the climatic variables. So, once that data is available with you, you can easily see that what all the extent, what all the possible attributes which can help that plant to grow. So, that type of modeling can be uh, explored. Now, you can see that these are the sample points which we have carried out in Himachal Pradesh. Now, these sample points, they looks to be a good, uh, good locations, but from there, you can see that we have generated these contours. You can see, have a look to this. Now, all these points are only the sample points. Okay. From the sample point, for individual plot, we have calculated the total importance value and every point will have some values. And from that value, you can generate the interpolated maps. You can see that this is the area where the, the, the density of more uh, uh, important species is possible. And that is only possible when you have the high density of points with certain value. So that you can see that these for individual plot, we have calculated the value. And from that value, we have interpolated. So these ISO lines or the contours can be generated for the entire area, which gives you an I idea that this particular area will have very high importance value because the species which are available has got lot of uh, importance. Similarly, we have species richness. Some, some plots you can see that these are the areas where the species richness is very high. Richness means you have more herbs, more shrubs, trees, climber like that. If number is high means within that 20 meter by 20 meter plot, the density is very high. If density is high, richness is high. If richness is high, you can have those contours which can show the entire area. Because if I if I show you this slide, this this will not give you any information. But the moment I interpolate them on the basis of the values, you will have a feel that how the entire area is governed with different densities. See, from there I can easily make out that this is the area where the richness is very high. I will not see this area from the on the basis of the sample points which I have collected. Okay. Similarly, we have economically important species. So, for every type of from the sample plot, I can derive the continuous data which gives me an idea that how this entire area is it rich in species, is it rich in uh, economically important species or is it rich in importance value. So, I can easily identify an area which can be under different categories. Okay. 
so once that is done so these are some of the uh, formations for map bamboo you can have a different tone and texture and color similarly for tea for acacia sal all those things you can have a different uh, altogether the tone texture and color similarly uh, there was one question that the temporal chain you can see that in 1973 the satellite image was taken 1990 and 1998 you can easily identify which are the core areas where the habitat is there and this is part of the one of the uh, the tiger reserve kalakar tiger reserve in tamil nadu which gives you that if you have 30 years of data you can identify the core zones where the habitat is existing so that type of analysis can be integrated within gis and can help you now you can say once from there you can see that you can do the classification and on the basis of classification you can see that whether it has increased or it is decreased and if it is decreased which is the uh, where is the area that decrease uh, what is the reason of that uh, 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 decrease and also you can associate the how much area is lost with respect to different time periods of 10 years 20 years or 30 years well this is one of the study which uh, in fact i have carried out on geospatial modeling of kharsu oak this was under the isro uh, geosphere biosphere program wherein i was telling you about the climate change scenarios here what we have done is uh, in uh, uh, this uh, kumau region uh, we have uh, mapped all the oak species by making use of remote sensing data and after that we have used the meteorological data the temperature and rainfall for all last 30 40 years and we have uh, done the proper uh, monthly average data was derived from there and after that we have used the soil map as well as uh, topo map all that data was used and then from there we have derived the climate change scenario so uh, uh, you can see that uh, if you there is a plus 1 degree temp temperature there will be a 78.75 uh, kilometer but if there is a plus 2 temperature 30.24 square kilometer and if there is 20 millimeter of rainfall distribution the 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 entire uh, the the population of that oak species may go down so you can see that that type of scenarios one can develop so what we are, what i am exactly i am doing is i am changing the climate surfaces means temperature surfaces and from there automatically the niche will shift from one place to another so that concept you can easily do and this particular paper was also published in good journal and it is being uh, uh, cited by many uh, international uh, 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 this thing Another thing was uh, uh, which was carried out was on data mining. You can you can use this data mining technique in order to identify the the uh, the the actual attributes uh, uh, for mapping a particular plant. Like if you if you have some samples of around ten thousand or twenty thousand point samples are there, you can put them into a data mining software, and from there you can get the actual what will be the uh, the 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 uh, the criterias or let us say the knowledge knowledge uh, information can be generated from those 10000 point and from those points you can easily identify that these are the areas where probable sites could be there of this particular species so data mining can also be used in order to do the site suitability modeling for a particular then we, we have this uh, biodiversity portals, uh, one is Indian Bioresource Information Network, uh, which is considered to be a decentralized portal, wherein the data from different uh, institutes is shared. I was also thinking that Ministry of Ayush can also be a part of this because we are into the process of expanding it even bigger. Now, Botanical, uh, this uh, Wildlife Institute of India, Forest Survey of India has also become the partner. Uh, CMAP is also uh, coming. Maybe Ministry of Ayush, like whatever the data you are coming, it can be shared among this portal because this portal is considered to be a unique portal on biodiversity related data. And this entire portal is, the funding is supported by Department of Biotechnology and it is considered to be one of the, uh, and the, the core partners are IARS and University of Agriculture Sciences Bangalore. The others are IHBT, uh, Nehu, uh, Calcutta University, FRLHT, uh, Bangalore, a tree is there all these five uh, bricks are there and now we are planning to have even 10 more bricks which can be which where they will also share the data and a user looking for a data will only have to go into one portal rather than going to n number of domain specific 
more, uh, more, uh, this thing. So it is totally based on the concept of web services. The another one is called as the biodiversity information system, which is the the where the data of the entire biodiversity project, which we have carried out in 12 years of time, that entire data is available. One can download and whatever the sample plots of nine, uh, around 17,000 sample plots uh, points are taken from this project is already available. So you can see that there is a portal. Uh, IBN is a decentralized and this is a centralized portal which which provides lot of data. Bhuvan anyway will be having a separate demonstration so I am not going into the details. The last uh, slide uh, is uh, I was little bit uh, fast in completing my uh, lecture maybe I could uh, I, I was thinking that you might have gone exhausted but if you see the the changing emphasis present uh, time is not for data generation the present time is for analysis because the maximum data is already collected and it has been digitized. And once the data is digitized, you can spend more time on analysis rather than because earlier projects, if you see 75 percent of time was going in data generation and you were hardly spending 10 to 20 percent of time on analysis. But if you see the reverse part of this pyramid, the analysis people are more putting because once you apply your own expertise, the value of the data will be more uh, valuable for the for the people rather than for the uh, this thing. So here you can say that you are spending 10 percent on data conversion, attribute tagging and more time on analysis. So with this few words uh, uh, the application of GIS is limited only by the imagination of those who use it. Only thing is you have to think what you have to do and rather than exploring the papers or uh, exploring the research article you better think what you want. And once things are clear to you, technology is clear to you, then you can really do wonders in this particular area. So thank you very much. Let us have